So management of eye discomfort uh, typically is a context of dry eyes, but don't forget the inflammation, which makes everything worse. Anything that's inflamed and irritated will respond worse, will heal worse to the injury. So no conflicts of interests. So patients come in complaining of pain all the time. It's different types of pain. It can be headaches, could be primary headaches, could be migraines that has absolutely nothing to do with this. Could be cluster headaches, or could be headaches that are caused by eye and orbit pressure that then cause, that stimulate worsening um, headaches. Pressure around the eyes, that is oftentimes also tender and worse with eye movement. The eyes can feel scratchy as if there's sand in the eyes. Uh, irritation, if there's itching, that's a very good indication that there is some allergic component because pain and dryness and irritation is one thing. The desire to itch and scratch typically indicates histamine release by mast cells in the conjunctiva. And we now have very good topical drops that prevent mast cells from releasing histamines. The old drops prevented histamines from binding to their receptors. And if you got 80% blockage, that's really good, but 20%, guess what? That still causes some irritation. Now we have drops like Patidae and Optivar uh, are the brand names that actually stabilize the mast cells and prevent histamine release in the first place. They are more effective, they're also more expensive. Um, but they are good for patients with allergies. And it's at least during allergy season, if you have allergies, these drops um, can be very helpful. So does this look comfortable? No, it looks terrible and it feels terrible. And, and this patient was miserable. Not only was he losing vision, but he was in pain. And he's, by the way, a wonderful advocate now locally. He lives in the Lansing um, uh, area in Michigan. Lansing is our capital. He's a very prominent local businessman and he's a big advocate for um, Graves' disease um, in his region. So just a brief introduction to uh, tear film. You have mucus layer that is made by goblet cells in the conjunctiva. It's the mucus layer that allows the other parts of the tear film to spread evenly and nicely over the conjunctiva, over the conjunctiva and cornea by reducing um, um, surface tension and things like that. But the main point I want to make of it is that the goblet cells that make the mucin are in the conjunctiva. In the context of inflammation, these goblet cells die. So patients who have chronic eye inflammation just don't make as much mucin as patients who have normal eyes. Which means that the water that the lacrimal glands make doesn't get distributed as well over the cornea, which means that there are areas of the cornea, even when you have uh, goblet cells, even when you have the, the liquid, that still end up getting dry. And then you have the oily layer that prevents evaporation. That comes from the glands, the meibomian glands, along the um, eyelids, eyelid margins by the eyelashes. Again, in the context of inflammation, they don't work as well. And so the tears that the lacrimal glands make not only doesn't distribute properly, but also evaporates more quickly. We can actually see all these things under the slit lamp during the exam, and we look for them specifically. The, tear, the other side of it is the tear drainage system. So um, I think one of these has this. I don't know if you can see. Uh, not really. This is the lacrimal gland, that's the main one. There are accessory ones, but this is the main one. Thank you. And the tear come down across the eye, cover the mucin-covered ocular surface. With every blink, the blink functions as a pump. It not only pushes these across the eye to collect debris and toward the tear drainage system, but there is a muscular area here that actually works as a pump, inflating and pushing the sac so the sac fills by um, a negative pressure and then pushes the fluid down to the nose. Yes? 
scarring? The scarring is in the cornea. Yes, that's the actual cornea. And that's what we want to avoid. But that's what will happen with dry eyes that are not treated. People f sometimes are surprised that the tears go into the nose, but that's why our nose runs when we cry. Okay, so that's where they're supposed to go. So this, and, and here are the tear drains, the puncta, which lead, which is like the drain in the bottom of a, of a sink. And they lead to the canaliculi, which are extremely thin um, ducts that collect into the sac and then into the nose. So I believe that natural lubrication is always superior to artificial lubrication. And there are things that we can do to improve natural lubrication. One is to control inflammation, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But warm compresses improve the oil gland function. It causes the oils to flow more freely because the oils are warm, and you know, you take butter, you warm it up, it becomes more fluid. Same thing here. And all I do is I take a washcloth, soak it in hot water at the sink, keep it heavy so that it's really hot, and just bend right over the sink to catch the drippings and hold it on your lids for a minute or two. That's all really that's needed. And you do that once or twice a day. That can really help clear the pores. Cold compresses, that helps sometimes with the inflammatory and congestive component. And you can alternate these. You know, just because you're doing warm doesn't mean you can't do cold. Trust your body. If one of them feels good, do it. Moisture chambers. Um, you can use them during the day if you're wearing glasses and put something around your glasses to keep the moisture in. Um, or at nighttime, it's goggles. And again, they trap the moisture, create a highly humid environment around your eyes and help uh, naturally lubricate your eyes with your own, basically your own body juices. Lubricating ointment. Lubricating ointment are not, in my opinion, like artificial tears. These are petroleum jelly based like Vaseline but extra pure. Most of them have mineral oil in them so that they will be liquidy, that you can actually spread them better. But the goal of that is to cover the aqueous or watery layer and prevent evaporation. They trap your natural tears on the ocular surface. It's why it doesn't matter how many lotions, Estee Lauder, etc., come up with, still the best thing for moisturizing your hands is Vaseline. Vaseline doesn't actually moisturize your hands. It doesn't moisturize anything. It traps your own body juices on your hands, and those moisturize your hands. That's what Vaseline does. It prevents evaporation. All the other lotions are trying to replace your own body juices, and all they do is reduce the um, secretion of some of these things, so you, become, you end up actually becoming dependent on some of these lotions. And then finally, punctual closure. Um, I typically will put in a punctal plug before I would cauterize, um, but there are techniques that Dr. Douglas, for example, uses where he does a very nice temporary cautery that works extremely well and he can reverse it easily. So there are different ways of doing punctal cautery. Um, and again, someone like him who treats a lot of patients with Gray's disease can do it in a way that is particularly suited to this disease and to the temporary nature of usually of the symptoms. I'll show you. So now I'll show pictures of what I just talked about. These are just examples of moisture chambers. You can make your own or you can buy them. They don't cost much. Warm compresses, he does it by leaning back. The problem is then you need to wring the towel dry and it becomes cold. So I prefer to keep it very hot and just lean right over the sink for a minute so that it's pretty warm and drippy. It's the water that contains the heat. It's not the washcloth. It's the water. Punctal plugs. Can you see that from over there? Okay. So here is a plugged punctum. We have one on this side and we have one on the opposing eyelid. These are just introducers that I use. And basically what you do is you put it in right at the entry, right at the drain. It's just like in your sink. Uh, it's not much different. It's just much smaller. And once you don't need it anymore, you pull it out. The problem with them is if you rub your eyes or anything like that, they fall out. And so you need to put them in again. And I'll have patients, I used to have patients that would call me with some regularity 
every few months and say, I think mine dropped out because my eyes now feel worse, and they'd come in and I'll put another one. These snug plugs, and I don't have any proprietary interest in them, but I've had really good experience with the snug plugs staying in. I've lost one, two um, punctual plugs in the past year and a half that I've used them. So um, these seem to stay in place. But when the time comes to remove them, you just pull them out. Hmm? Yes. So the question is, how do you know that you need to remove them? You start really tearing in a way, so you, you have dry eyes. Tear is a reflex to the dry eyes. You put in the, I put in the punctal plugs or do punctal cautery, and your um, dry eyes are no longer so dry, so you don't need as much tearing. So you stop tearing, and then you start tearing again because now your eyes are normal. You no longer need the punctal plugs. Now you just need the drain. You come in, and we pull them out. Or reverse the, the cautery. A humidifier next to the bed can be very good. The only risk with humidifiers is that if you don't change the filter regularly, if you don't change the water regularly, it can really be a harbinger for mold. And so I am somewhat reluctant to recommend them because, again, it's operator dependent. You really need to be on top of it. And when something goes bad, you need to get rid of it and buy a new one. If you bleach the, the um, inside of the, of the water container, that's great, but you then don't want bleach water to be humidified and evaporated into your room, so you've got to wash it really, really well. So it just takes some maintenance. Uh, and the hot water um, humidifiers uh, have their own issues. So again, not not right for everybody, but humidifiers can be very helpful if your house is very dry. Yes? Uh, white vinegar and, and a lot safer. A lot safer than bleach. So white vinegar in the humidifier will help avoid mold buildup. Absolutely. Thank you. And if you, if you have, and everybody's bedroom has dust mites. You can't not have dust mites. And uh, dust mites love, love moisture. I do have on my bed a cover that is impenetrant, so, and, and our pillows also. So I think there was a mention before. Um, yeah, Dr. Wood mentioned pillows. Don't save your pillows 20 years. Don't get attached to your pillows. After a few years, get rid of your pillows by another pair of pillows. Now, these are just examples of ointments. These are petroleum-based, generally speaking. Not all of them, but most of them are petroleum-based. The point is that they uh, reduce evaporation. They coat the eye. These are um, different um, advantages of the ointment. This is how they work. The key is that they do blur vision, so people don't like them so much. But if you blink a few times and give it five, ten minutes, it gets much better. So just have patience. But don't put them on and then think you're going to go driving within the next minute. You know, give it 10, 15 minutes. And don't put too much. People also tend to just goob up their eyes. And all you need is a kernel or two of rice because you just need a very thin film, and that's sufficient. Artificial lubrication. All of that was how to improve your own body's lubricating abilities. Artificial lubrication, and you can see that there are a lot of different options, and this is a small fraction of what's available in the pharmacy aisle. <laughs> can I get something to drink? Yeah, thanks. So this is how you put them in. If it drips all over your face, that's par for the course. Uh, don't worry too much about it. There are, um, if you look at, oh, thank you so much. I'm going to read the different substances that are used to lubricate. These are all in commercial products. Hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose. Oh, it's missing a C here. Carboxyl methyl cellulose. Polyvinyl alcohol. Glycerin. Tetrahydrosoline. None of these sound all that appetizing, which is why I, I really believe that using your own body's um, lubrication is best. But 
if you need artificial lubrication, you need artificial lubrication. And um, these work very well. And a lot of money is spent by companies coming up with a formulation that would really address dry eyes. I do prefer the thicker, more viscous version because it doesn't... You put it in, it does blur your vision maybe a little bit, but it sticks around for a few hours. And, and that really helps. Otherwise, it's just putting it in and it's draining it down, and you're putting it in and it's draining down. The issue of preservatives is a big one. It used to be that everything was benzalkonium chloride preserved. And um, I wrote a paper many years ago about severe conjunctival uh, reaction to benzalkonium chloride, where the conjunctiva actually scarred the eye shut in a sense. So you, can, you will still find drops that have benzalkonium, benzalkonium chloride as, uh, as a preservative. It's a very good preservative. But if you're using this chronically, as opposed to just every once in a while, then that's an issue. If you have um, conjunctivitis and you need the bacterial eye dro antibacterial eye drop and you're going to use it for a week, this is fine. But if you're going to be using lubricating drops for months or years, this is not so good. There are now new versions of preservatives like perborate. Hello? Okay. Uh, per um, perborate, burate, polyquad, sorbic acid. The basic gist of these is that on contact with the fluid of the eye, they evaporate. So it preserves, meaning it prevents bacterial um, overgrowth in the bottle. But it does not stay on the ocular surface. So that's a significant advance. These are typically brand names, so they cost a few dollars more. Um, but I think in many ways they, they are worth it if you're going to be using something for a prolonged period of time. Of course, there's also preservative-free, which are more expensive, but they come in individual vials. And you can use a vial for a few drops in the course of a, of a day, but then you've got to toss it away. Very important thing is not to touch the tip of those drops, droppers, to your eye, because that's how bacteria get transmitted. We all think of ourselves as clean, but we are full of bacteria, and that's fine. But if you allow the bacteria to overgrow in a bottle, that's when it's not. So don't stick that uh, bottle tip right into your eye and have it come in contact with your eye or with the skin. Keep it a distance, as I showed you on that picture before. Don't worry about it. If something goes on your cheek, you can wipe it off. So the, my general recommendations are the viscous artificial tears during the day. Uh, like gels which are oftentimes marketed as moderate to severe dry eyes with mild preservatives or preservative free and then the petroleum based ointments at least in bedtime and if you have severe eye irritation try them at least for a few days much more frequently just to give your eye a rest warm compresses potentially alternating with cold compresses and uh, moisture chambers as needed um, they can be a pain you need to get used to them but they can really, really uh, have a great impact on patients who need them. I will try the punctal occlusion um, typically before moisture chambers, but after there's a course of, of some lubrication. Um, but again, it depends on the patient. If the patient is coming from a distance, I would rather try the, the punctal occlusion if I really think that that's what they need. And by the way, I, I put it at the bottom, never use never use an intracanicular plug. These were um, popular a few years ago, maybe a decade ago. Herrick plugs are among them. Smart plugs are among them. They are not sitting at the surface where you can easily take them out because you can see them, but they are inserted deep into the system and then you really don't know where they are and what they do. And um, oftentimes oculoplastic surgeons like me need to take them out and reconstruct the tear drainage system because everything kind of scarred shut and it's a real problem. So, I'm yep, to keep you in yep I'm, I'm almost done. Actually, I think I am done. And then tear quality enhancement, flaxseed, vitamins, antioxidants, eat well, exercise, don't smoke. And then finally, immune modulation. And I'm a neophyte when it comes to inflammation. I'm not an immunologist. Dr. Douglas is an immunologist, um, so I would defer the big immune modulation questions to him. But um, 
Steroid drops can sometimes be helpful as a temporizing measure. You don't want to use them long term, but as a temporizing measure, they can be helpful. Mast self stabilizers like Pataday and Optiva, which prevent histamine release. So if you have itching and allergies, these are not improved with oral medications. The Zyrtex, the Claritins, etc., don't help eye allergies. And there's just not enough of those antihistamines that get to the eye. And we have a product that's better anyway, which is the mast cell stabilizers that prevent the histamine from being released in the first place. So in the context of allergy, use this. Topical cyclosporins, so if you have significant inflammation and dry eye in that context, Restasis has been shown in the context of inflammation, specifically with Jorgen disease, but also with others, that it improves tear quality and tear production um, by reducing the local inflammation. And finally, there are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs or drops. These are the eye, topical eye drop equivalents of ibuprofen. They do work short term after surgeries and things like that, like cataract surgery, they're used. But I would say don't use them in the eye long term. There are rare but severe reports of severe reactions that cause corneal melt. Uh, so this is not something that you want to do on a long-term basis, at least not without uh, very careful, watchful observation by an ophthalmologist. So I'll end by saying go blue.